Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopez and today I'm joined by Dr. John Paul Wright. He is Professor of Criminal Justice in the Division of Criminal Justice at the University of Cincinnati in the US. He has published over 130 scholarly articles in criminology, psychology, behavioral genetics and molecular genetics journals and is a frequent lecturer to professional organizations interested in the development of serious violent offending. The winner of her teaching awards, he teaches in the area of life course development and biosocial criminology. So Dr. Wright, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Hello, Ricardo. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. So when you study criminal behavior, do you focus on some types of behavior or do you study all kinds of criminal behavior that that there's out there yeah so the the, the short answer is all kinds uh the the deeper answer is uh, that <clears throat> one of the things that <clears throat> i think separates uh folks like like a life course people life course criminologists biosocial crim is that we see crime, criminal behavior, not just in the context of, you know, people are violating laws and so forth, because that's a, sometimes a very subjective thing, um, but as a, as a strategy that, that criminal conduct is often a strategy to get resources. Uh, it's a, really a mechanism of cheating. If you think about what the essence of, of uh, most criminal conduct is, it, it's cheating, right? It's getting ahead. Uh, without uh, putting in putting in the work, and uh, you know that that can take a variety of forms. But when you see it as a as a as a strategy, sometimes sometimes even an adaptive strategy that takes it out of the legal realm, and then you start to see other connections there. So, yeah, we use indicators of criminal behavior, but we also use other indicators of uh, you know uh, behaviors that what what people would call analogous behaviors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I asked you that question because I guess that uh, yeah. many times what we see uh, referring to uh, referred to as criminal behavior is basically violent criminal mm -hmm. behavior. But I mean, do you study other more minor things? Oh, ab absolutely. Because you know, one of the you know it's called the brute facts of, of crime is what we call the generality of it, right? That uh, people who commit very serious acts of criminal conduct, right? It's, you know, premeditated assaults and homicides and armed robberies and what have you, also commit just a variety of other types of offenses. And even if we go out of the offense categories, they do a lot of other things that, um, you know, are correlated with criminal conduct that, that cause a lot of problems in their life, lives of others and in society. So, yeah, the, uh, you know, it, it's up and uh, sort of up and down from, from trivial to very serious. And again, these types of actions are often correlated uh, into a broader uh, underlying latent trait uh, that we would call criminality. Mm -hmm. So if someone commits a type of crime, is it more likely for them to commit other types of crime? Is there a correlation between different types? Um, so what, what the research literature tells us is that very few people involved in criminal conduct specialize, right? Okay. That they're just restricted to a type of crime. Uh, you know, the, the sort of the days of the bank robbers, right? Uh, uh, are, 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 are over if they ever really existed. And that if you engage in one type of criminal conduct, you're substantially more likely to engage in other types of criminal conduct, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you think about it too, the, the, uh, there's something called the experiential effect of crime, right? That some people will engage in crime initially and find out, <laughs> not for me, they don't like it. Uh, perhaps they get caught, perhaps it's embarrassing, perhaps their conscience bothers them. Uh, and, and they'll sort of, you know, move away from that. Other people find out that it can be fun, exciting, exhilarating, that they get status from it. 
So the attractors to them are, are, are realized and they're, and they're different. And that experience of committing crime becomes self-reinforcing. Mm -hmm. Are all types of crime anti-social? I mean, does someone have to be anti-social to commit crimes or not? No, no not at all. Um, you know, the, sort of the, the one and done folks, if, if, if you think of it like this, people that are entirely functional in every other realm of, of, of their life, um, you know, sometimes they'll develop alcohol and drug habits, right, that, that really take them down a different pathway. But they didn't have uh, problems with adaptation prior to that. Or you'll see people that, um, you know, just, just hit mental illness will develop, or you'll see folks that really do um, get in over their heads or make a mistake, but it's not a longstanding pattern uh, with them. It, it, it's something that, you know, when it happens, it's like, it shocks everybody. So we often make that distinction that, you know, for, for real criminal conduct, if we want to call it like that, but one of the things we look for is stability over time. And that, again, is one of the brute facts of crime, that uh, people who engage in crime not only engage in a variety, but they engage in crime across time, across place, across situation, uh, sometimes for very long periods of their life. Mm -hmm. Is there any correlation between criminal behavior and some personality traits? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when, when you think about conscientiousness, Right. Uh, you know, and everything that's embedded in, in conscientiousness, uh, like self-control, planning, foresight, uh, uh, thinking uh, morally. Right. Uh, the restraint, the inhibition that comes with high levels of conscientiousness. That, that's a natural restraining factor in a personality structure, uh, even agreeableness. Right. Uh, people who are very disagreeable. Um, you know, you'll often see those are the, that type of the person of, of, of personality will uh, get them into trouble and because it generates a lot of conflict. Um, and, and there's some budding evidence on, on openness. Uh, you know, we, we generally think of openness as, you know, this great factor that leads us to a variety of experiences. And that that is right. Uh, true. Right. But there's also sort of another side of that, and that is, you know, openness without conscientiousness, openness without some restraint can also lead people into, you know, drug use and other types of experiences and other types of social networks that then really negatively affect their lives. Mm -hmm. Is criminal behavior heritable in any way? Does it have a genetic basis? Uh, short answer is yes. And that's actually what, you know, when, when, when uh, we started working in this area, you know, this is, this is you know, still remains, unfortunately, in, in my field, you know, taboo and people really sort of shut down or get very upset about it. But, you know, the, the question that we wanted to answer when we started was, you know, criminal conduct heritable, right? Everything else is. And... It would be really remarkable, right, if human violence and strategies that humans use to engage in violence and, um, you know, if you think about criminal behavior as the use of force or fraud to obtain resources, that that orientation also wouldn't be heritable. So there are now, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of, of studies um, uh, twin-based studies that, that assessed heritability, and and depending on what time in life you're looking, and depending on um, what you're measuring, how well you measure it, you know, we we find heritabilities between you know somewhere between 0.5 to 0.85. So you know, best guess is you know somewhere in that range, uh, but clearly it's not zero, which would be unheard of. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, for every other human uh, trait and, and behavior. And I, and I still remain sort of mystified sometimes that people want to sort of exempt uh, certain behaviors from the, that, that type of umbrella. But, but yeah, but, but I would also say the, you know, outside of heritable, 
the other big p- component of that's non-shared environment. Um, and we're, you know, th- theoretically, you know, we know non-shared environments are supposed to make the things that make people different. Turns out it's really difficult to measure. Turns out that we're really often not sure what those things might be. And, um, you know, it, it, it does get complex, but when we say that things are heritable, it doesn't mean that they're inherited. Uh, these are all probabilistic statements, estimates of population variance. And it certainly doesn't mean that environment doesn't matter, which is what people tend to automatically go to. You know? mm-hmm. uh, may, uh, about the non-shared environment, could there be any element of peer pressure or, I mean, the kinds of people, uh, people establish relationships with? Oh, a- absolutely. Uh, you know, peers uh, have effects very early in our lives, right? And it, the mechanisms of socialization, in fact, you know, Judith Rich Harris argued that that's the primary uh, source of social, socialization, not even necessarily parents. And in, in, in criminology, you know, we've had this forever debate about the impact of delinquent peers. Was it the product of socialization or is it the product of self-selection? Right. Well, probably both. And, you know, we do know that that uh, people involved in the criminal lifestyle uh, do select a lot of their peers from within that lifestyle. Right. Just like, you know, professors and and bloggers and, you know, if you, you know, you get to know the networks of, of the type of uh, type of work you do, and the types of people that you associate with. So it, it should be at all unusual right um but but yeah peer networks are are very important and I, i always tell people if you want to change your life change your friends <laughs> you know that's how important they can be mm-hmm. yeah uh, are you also interested in the possible evolutionary basis of criminal behavior i mean could it be that some of these behaviors that in modern societies we classify as criminal Uh, could they have been adaptive to more ancient environments? Absolutely. I mean, if, if you, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll hear the things, violence doesn't solve anything, right? And, and I understand the, the, the intention and the morality uh, behind that. But evolutionarily speaking, it solves a lot <laughs> and permanently, right? Um, and then... Human beings are very good at warfare. They're very good at physical violence. Uh, I mean, we've really evolved this to, you know, very high levels. So evolutionarily speaking, right, um, when the environmental conditions were different, right, when, you know, the tribe that you've never seen before, Uh, that represents a huge threat because they could simply come in and kill everybody, right, and take their stuff. And, you know, this this was sort of normal. You know, this was practiced widely. Uh, when we look at, uh, for example, right, Native Americans in the United States, um, you know, warfare was, was sort of unending. And it was just sort of an agreed upon way of doing things uh, as, as well that, you know, there, there would people were captured, they were automatically killed, you know, uh, and a variety of reasons for that. But, but yes, violence, uh, even sort of conning people out of their stuff, very effective, far more effective than violence sometimes. And I think this is why we see these evolutionary overtones, you know, even uh, males, when we talk about evolution, right, the male body was essentially evolved, right, for combat and warfare. And you know, see major differences in upper body strength and threat perception, uh, hand strength, right? Coordination, uh, aggression, right? Being male uh, is, is the strongest biological factor we know of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So since we're talking about the causes behind criminal, the development of criminal behavior, Are there any prenatal factors that people have already identified that could influence the development of this type of behavior? Yeah, um, some have been identified in the literature. So uh, preeclampsia, 
uh, you know, where there's oxygen deprivation to the brain, uh, you know, sometimes even for, for fairly short periods, uh, especially during delivery, uh, ha has been a factor that's been identified. Other types of, you know, risks associated with pregnancies that uh, have been, you know, correlated with aggression and so forth later on. Uh, I'd say the, 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 the research in that area, and I don't want to speak out of turn, is there's not a whole lot of it, right? And it, it, it's a truism that when you measure something, right, in, in a very early life, right, seeing a correlation or a predictor or factor like later life, just statistically these things weaken, right? So, um, you know, it's not uncommon to see, well, we have risks uh, in pregnancy and they don't predict like 30 years out, <laughs> uh, but they do predict earlier in time. And that's one of the things that we're beginning to understand is as humans develop, you're right, you're seeing these cascading of uh, developmental events, right? The brain, right, growth, growth and, uh, you know, neuronal uh, increases and so forth, right? That these things matter, that they can uh, adjust, if you will, from some of those prenatal factors. I'd also say prenatal diet, you know, uh, pretty important. Uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, could it be that uh, factors that interfere with the development, the proper development of the prefrontal cortex play yeah. a role here? Because you mentioned, for example, self-control earlier, and I think that a properly developed prefrontal cortex is associated with higher levels of self-control, correct? Absolutely. Um, so in, 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 in criminology, right, uh, low self-control is this ubiquitous predictor. Mm -hmm. It predicts everything, um, you know, from the friends you have to how you uh, respond in situations to criminal, long-term criminal conduct everything and it predicts everything across the life course so it tells us that it's really important okay and yet you know our field has sort of not made that jump from well self we know where self-control is housed in the brain right the frontal the prefrontal cortex we know that there are developmental right sequences in the frontal prefrontal cortex that it takes longer for that region of the brain to develop. It develops uh, symmetrically between males and females, right? Females developing, you know, in that area a little or earlier, so sooner in life, right? So we also know that that's where the greatest variation is in, in between human beings. So yes, uh, to me, it's, it, it's a easy jump from low self-control to prefrontal cortex functioning and all the other types of issues that we see in life. Mm -hmm. And because the prefrontal cortex takes so long to fully develop, could that explain why, for example, uh, we see more risky behavior in adolescents? Yeah, that's, that's one of the theories, right? Uh, that, it, it, you know, especially for, for females, you know, you see the you know, expansion of the prefrontal cortex and the wiring and networking and so forth, and it happens rapidly, and then it sort of like protects itself, right? As with males, it's still going on, and it's still going on, and it's still going on, um, and and it takes longer, you know, I guess the current estimate is somewhere in the early 20s, and it's never really done. You know, that's one of the things about brain development that, that, that they've learned, it's never really done. Um, but that openness, if you think about it like this as well, I mean, what else do men do or young men do that could insult the brain? They fight, right? They play, uh, they play soccer. <laughs> they engage in very aggressive sports. They right, do all sorts of things. So, so the, the window of vulnerability, right, uh, neuronal uh, brain vulnerability for males is actually longer. Uh, than for females and probably play some role in the variation that we see uh, in self-control uh, amongst young, uh, young men and men. Mm -hmm. What is the earliest stage where we can already predict the levels of self-control that a particular child 
will yeah. develop. I mean, I know that there's things like the marshmallow test mm -hmm. that, I mean, recently it's been questioned a little bit, at least I remember that two years ago there was some controversy about it. I don't know the exact details, but what about that? Yeah, so young children, variation in young children, right? I, I'd say four years of age, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think Terry Moffat and uh, as von Caspi and some of those folks have shown that, you know, 40 years of age, we, we can predict with some degree of accuracy who's going to be the, the serious juvenile delinquent, right? And that tells you, one, early onset really does matter. And by onset, we're talking about, you know, just highly disruptive behavior. Uh, sometimes you'll see it you know, classified as oppositional defiant and later conduct disorder. Uh, it's very, very important. And then even within the conduct disorder groups, one of the fascinating things about uh, the research now is that we've seen uh, the ability of, you know, psychologists have created uh, the, the callous and unemotional traits of what they call them. So even amongst conduct disorder children, there's a core group of kids in there who, who are really at high risk for later violence and so forth. It turns out that these are the callous and unemotional uh, kids. So, you know, very, we, we can actually tell fairly early in life. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, we've already talked about the influence that peers might have on the development of criminal behavior. What about the shared environment? Talking again about behavioral genetics, is it that there are there have been any uh, identified factors related to, for example, maternal or paternal behavior that influence criminal behavior? Yeah. So let, let me let me start by saying that. You know, we've, we've, we've known for a long time, like since records have been kept, that crime runs in families, right? That you'll see it intergenerationally. Um, and we also have known that even if the kid, uh, if, if the kid has a criminal father, right, especially, uh, even if the kid doesn't know that father, it increases the likelihood by, uh, that they'll start engaging in crime and so forth by about 20%. So this has been, you know, having criminal parents is a, is a thing. <laughs> it runs in families. It's intergenerational. We find it everywhere, every country, right, every time period. So what do we make? How do we make sense out of that? Well, naturally, you know, you've got uh, genetic transmission, uh, which, which is also a real process <laughs> that we clearly are concerned about. But, but the other part of that, and, and, and this is sort of the, you know, the hammer on the nail is that the environment that that some of these parents provide is very conducive to crime and aggression um, uh, in, in, with their kids. So separating that out is very difficult, right? Um, there are, you know, there are. If you look at some of the ethnographic studies on on crime and uh, so forth, there are parents who bring their kids into the lifestyle. There are kid, parents who take their kids out on drug deals and take their kids out on, you know, uh, in, engaged in all sorts of affair who expect it of them, uh, even at very young ages. And uh, it, again, you know, that's hard to parcel out in a study. In terms of the behavioral genetics of it, right, after we, you know, look at, you know, say, okay, well, this is much of it is genetic. What about the shared environment? You know, the shared environment in, 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 most, um, in most studies doesn't really pop out. And, you know, that's caused a lot of conflict, a lot of consternation, because most of our theories are, are, are about shared environment, right? Shared environments are supposed to make people the same. Well, it turns out they highlight differences, right? And shared environmental influences uh, in in delinquency right with the you know with adolescence you'll see maybe 10 percent right um which, which is not to say that's unimportant but it certainly isn't what we expected when we started doing this and then when you got get up into like a serious adult criminal conduct it's oftentimes not uh, unusual to see it not have any effect not that uh, right right around zero so that ought to cause us to sort of re-theorize what you know, what our understanding of things instead of sort of entrenching 
uh, and, and say, oh, it's got, it's got to be shared environment, right? Well, might, but let's, let's, let's sort of think about that, what that means. And why do kids, you know, let's back this stuff, let's reverse it. Kids in the same family, right? And this was a great insight, again, by Judy Harris, that often turn out very differently. And you can, you know, you'll see a family, you know, just very functional, very, all of this stuff, and that one kid, typically the male, right? Uh, turns out to have, you know, start getting arrested at 12 and just keeps on going in prison by 30, right? No one else in the family. They grew up in this identical house, same uh, household, right? Identical pressure, everything. Uh, but, but that's not uncommon. You know, so we have, well, in, in family studies, you see a wide range of variation in outcomes amongst children, right? Uh, and I think part of what happens is amongst like criminal parents, if I can use that term, right? Parents with a long history of engaging in crime and so forth. Uh, you, you see even there that, you know, some children will be just fine, right? But they're much higher risk and they're much higher risk for a variety of reasons, both, both probably biological and social. Mm -hmm. Are there any major sex differences in predisposition to criminal behavior? Huge. Yeah, huge. Uh, sex differences in criminal behavior are the largest differences, right, that, that, that we have. Uh, uh, and this has been true probably from the dawn of time. Uh, the very first laws, right, that, that, that were passed uh, were, were really designed to control male behavior. And as I tell folks, right, we have a criminal justice system, right, where, you know, 85, 90, 95 percent of the people involved in it are male. There's a reason for this. And it's not sexism and it's not all the other explanations. It is, you know, we have to control uh, male violent conduct because it can be extremely damaging uh, uh, to a society. It, you know, it can rip apart a society very, very easily. So, you know, we, every single study, you'll, you'll see, you know, male, right, uh, is at that top of that risk factor. And again, there, it's exactly what you would expect, right, from an evolutionary perspective, right? Uh, males were designed for combat and uh, aggression and, and seeing aggression, picking it up and looking at finding the indicators and, you know, uh, body strength coordination, all of that stuff. All these things are just, you know, evolved to help us, uh, you know, kill the tribe down the road so we can take their stuff, you know, and that's, that's sort of the essence of survival sometimes. So, uh, yeah, being male, it, like I said, is, is the, 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 the primary factor. And, and that doesn't mean to uh, Ricardo that, that socialization is unimportant, right? There's this debate that, you know, uh, you know, uh, the toxic masculinity, masculinity and so forth. And outside of the political overtones of those things, uh, there, there is or can be elements of masculinity are pretty damaging, right? And when you look in prisons and you look at some of these very violent guys, it's very damaging. It's damaging to their own lives, damaging to the lives of the people around them. Mm -hmm. Could that have something to do with levels of self-control? I mean, are there sex differences in terms of self-control? Is it that, for example, women you, uh, tend to show higher levels of self-control than men? Yeah, so uh, they, they do on average, okay? And how can I say this? Um, You know, people play to their strengths, right? Even in crime. And, and crime has always, has always been a sort of a young man's game. It's physical, it's dangerous, it takes a huge toll on a person's body and, and, and so forth. And, it, and strength is oftentimes, you know, it, it, it's a requirement. Um, so men are physically aggressive. But when we turn and we look at, at women, right, and women involved in, in the criminal lifestyle, you know, um, men, men top out like the measures of direct aggression, right? Well, women top out the measures of indirect aggression, right? And what that means is that, you know, skillful verbal manipulation, right? Rumors of uh, pitting people off against themselves. I mean, there is a dark side 
right, to female conduct that that we see, right, uh, especially amongst those involved in the criminal lifestyle who are surviving through really through manipulation. And when you look inside, say, for example, gangs, you know, uh, women involved in gangs will, you know, sleep with one guy and then they'll sleep with the guy up at, 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 the, at the next rank, <laughs> right? This is a strategy to, to, to move up, to, for, to get resources, to find safety, to get status and so forth. Um, so, so, yeah, it's just, it's different. And we have to pay attention to the, you know, the physical aggression of men, right? But some of the indirect aggressions of, of uh, women, we, we tend to not realize sometimes and not see the coordination and, and the connection because there is a connection there. Uh, a lot of violence is spun out of those dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, have we already established some social factors as also influencing criminal behavior? Because, for example, I've had on the show Dr. Martin Daly, the evolutionary psychologist, and Uh, according to his research, at least, it seems that things like perceived economic inequality produce higher levels of uh, criminal behavior, violent behavior in, in men. Mm -hmm. Well, th there are clearly social factors. I, I, I've, you know, I, I used to, a long time ago, I used to be like, you know, poverty and all the standard, you know, inequality and, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily true anymore because um, if it ever necessarily was, first of all, crime doesn't have and flow with changes in economics, right? Uh, periods of great, you know, wealth accumulation, so forth, had very high crime rates, <laughs> periods where there's been, you know, economic recessions or depressions, lower crime rates. So it doesn't track real well uh, at the individual level. It is, difficult to sort sort out because one of the outcomes of engaging in a pattern of crime and so forth, right, is that you're failing in a lot of other areas. So they, you know, they, they get kicked out of school or they fail out of school, right? Uh, so they don't typically have a college degree, they're not well educated. Um, you know, that sets in motion a chain reaction of other events. They're often not very employable, really don't want, and I'm talking about like the truly criminal here, Um, you know, don't want it. They don't, don't want to get up and go to work <laughs> and so forth. So, you know, one of the outcomes of, of that lifestyle is poverty. It, it's, it, it is being cemented at the bottom of the economic ladder. And that, you know, that, that makes it sometimes difficult to, you know, say, well, it's poverty. Well, poverty is also the outcome. Uh, but, but I would say in terms of what matters, I, you know, There are cultural factors that clearly matter, um, at, at least in, in my mind, my understanding right now, that there are you know places in the United States, for example, right, where crime is very you know relatively high, uh, limited geographic areas, right, and uh, where you know you have fair amount of males engaging in it and it builds up sort of this cultural status system and people get you know respect or they get uh, brought into that sort of micro culture uh they're rewarded for it uh you know they, they get a name out of it and and it per, it's sort of an inverted value system right Uh, standard value system, right? Get up, delay gratification, delay, 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 right? Go to school, put up all that delay, 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 right? But, but the criminal lifestyle says you don't have to do any of that. You can get all of that this way, right? Without all the effort, without all the work and, right, where you and I might see like getting arrested and going to prison as a really bad thing, right? You know, that becomes a sign of, of authenticity in the criminal lifestyle. So the value system gets inverted. Uh, well, you know, people are socialized into that. They are, there are attractors to that. And, um, you know, that, that there's a fair amount of ethnography that, that shows that as well. So, you know, the socialization of crime is important. And that goes back to like peer networks and so forth. So it matters where you live, right? Uh, the types of people that your parents are bringing around 
you know, are important. Yeah. Earlier, I've asked you about personality traits. What about the dark triad traits? Are they associated with criminal behavior? Yeah, so uh, dark triad, right? Uh, uh, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, and oh, yeah. The, uh, nar narcissism. Narcissism, right? Narcissism, yeah. So, you know, the idea behind the sort of the dark dark traits and what are the what are the personality factors that generally are, are most associated with uh, bad outcomes in a person's life and you can really make the case that you know clinical narcissism clinical psychopathy right machiavellian uh, orientations lead to a lot of problems um, so we did some research in this area. Uh, you know, we've got some others that, that we're doing, uh, other things that we're doing with it. But yeah, it's correlated, uh, probably predictive, right? That especially the uh, psychopathy part, right? And in, in, again, in the academic literature, we have to have the fight over, well, is it narcissism or is it psychopathy? Or are these things really clinging together? Uh, you know, which is all fine. That's what we do. But the reality on the ground is, right, if you have a lot of dark traits, your life is different. You see the world differently. You see people in your world differently. And uh, that makes all, all the difference in the world because, you know, one of the, when we look at cognitive factors, right, um, criminal offenders tend to have these thinking styles that, uh, create a lot of, you know, a lot of excuses for their conduct um, that, and I think they're called criminal thinking errors, right? If that gives you any indication of how, you know, academics and treatment people see it, but, but generally, you know, they blame the victim. They're not responsible. There's something else that was, someone else did something worse, or even though they killed their entire family, they're still good people. They have that sort of orientation. Um, you know, the, these are wrapped up in dark traits and, um, the dark traits are sort of, a, um, the things that we, we think about, but it's the thinking processes that come out of those traits that are uh, absolutely crucial, uh, and targets for, uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. So one last question. With all of this knowledge, could it be used to inform the criminal justice system in any way? I mean, in terms of informing perhaps judges and the sentences that they pass on people and things like that? Uh, you know, to some degree it is already. I mean, when you know, if you look at standard sentencing schemes, they're looking at what well, prior behavior, right? Yeah. Prior criminal conduct. Um, and, and what have you. And then in the United States, we'll have pre-sentence investigations, right? So they're looking at personality, they're looking at other types of social relationships and so forth. Uh, so in some ways they capture some of that. I'm, I'm always a little, um, th there might be certain, certain specific areas where this work would be important, right? But in terms of justice, in terms of, okay, this person's right, done or wrong, um, you know, in my mind at least, and I could be wrong on this and convinced otherwise, but, you know, the justice system ought to be about correcting that wrong. Mm -hmm. And, right, the sort of the theories behind it and the empirical work and so forth is not really the place. Uh, it's not in the courtroom, right, um, necessarily. But, you know, we're seeing more and more information. But one of the problems that, that you're going to get, or that, we're, that we're going to have, is say, say psychopathy, right? You know, um, we have pretty decent measures of whether or not a person's a psychopath or the range of psychopathic traits. Same, you know, dark triads tapping into that. Callous and unemotional traits, right? Kind of near psychopathic traits in adulthood, right? Uh, but in a courtroom, the last thing you want to do is label someone who's presumed innocent as a psychopath, uh, because that's a huge biasing factor. And, and while people may think of it in academia, academia is something clinical or what have you, right, to the normal ear, right, this means, you know, 
somebody that, that's going to, you know, engage in cannibalism with, with some farva, farva beans, you know, that's their image of the psychopath. So I, I'm always hesitant on, on getting some of this stuff too involved in the justice system, because what really matters is what did the person do? And what is the corrective action that, that the justice system, you know, um, seeks to address? Mm -hmm. uh, in the US, you have juries, right? That's perhaps another uh, source of bias. In Portugal, we don't have any of that. We only have the judge or judges. So... Mm -hmm. Right. Yep, yep. And, and you know, we're, we're talking about some fairly technical stuff, right? Well outside the realm of law. And we're also, we also have to I think, you know, as academics, we have to have some humility, right? That our, our understanding, especially the biological basis of human behavior is really in its infancy, right? We, we just now have the technology where we're, you know, looking at different types of genetic structures and we're looking inside and period of the brain and we're doing these fairly rudimentary tests. We don't know what's gonna happen, right? Uh, in, in 10, 20, 30 years, right? So our understanding on this is going to change and it's going to shift and it's, it's going to evolve, right? Um, and, and I think while there's sometimes the rush that, that people think, well, we could use this and you know people wouldn't be held as accountable. Well, the other side of it is that we could use this and people are held to a very, could be held to a very high standard, right? So my view right now is, you know, the courts can decide these things. Academic research should be academic research. And in maybe areas where there, there are some policy uh, things we can help out with. But overall, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with it, you know, being introduced on a broad scale inside inside the, the courtroom. In the United States, you know, about 95 percent of all cases are disposed of through plea bargaining. And, you know, that, it's fairly efficient. And it's you know, there, there are good reasons for that. So only 5% of the time cases are going to trial. Uh, but it's important, right? You don't want to, you don't want jurors or judges, right, who are trained in law, who may have some side uh, expertise or knowledge in, you know, human development or something to buy into theories and perspectives that, that may be in their infancy may be wrong. We've had that happen, right? The, the extreme socialization uh, part of uh, theories, right? Uh, that was wo woven into the juvenile justice system for a very long period of time. And lots of bad things came out of that. You know, so th that's why I sort of focus on, on justice and to a certain degree, retribution, rehabilitation. Um, but if you start bringing this stuff in, boy, you don't know where that's, where that's gonna end. Okay, so let's end on that note. Just before we go, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Oh boy, uh, usually at the website, you know, uh, at, at uc.edu and, uh, you know, just throughout the journals. I, I'm, I'm not the type of, of scholar that just constantly puts, <laughs> I'm uncomfortable right with that because I see you know, it's like, yeah, every scholar has an ego. They all want to, we all want to be cited and our work recognized. But I'm of the opinion anymore, especially if you look at the research on our research, <laughs> right? We have real problems that we need to address uh, and how we do things and, and replication is a major issue. And uh, the, the psychologists have done just a, a huge, given us a huge gift and pushing this area forward. And I think we need as, as criminologists to sort of step back, you know, maybe not promote so much, think about what we're getting right, what we're getting wrong and why and fix it. You know, so um, that's why I'm a little, I'm always hesitant, to, you know, for self-promotion. It's like some of the stuff that I publish is gonna be, is gonna be wrong, right? And that's the nature of science and that's, that's okay. Right. Uh, but I don't want people clamoring towards it and saying it's gospel because it's not. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Wright, thank you for coming on the show. It was a real pleasure to talk yeah. to you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. 
Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing this channel for three years, bringing you top academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Even one dollar would already be a great help. Otherwise, you also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. And please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button if you liked the interview. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Lanius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zoop, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Spigny, Phil Cavana, Cory Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omri Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Librant, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Staten T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Ladeza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adaner Usmani, my, pro my producer, Zizar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, v Vega Gidi, Sardis France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michael, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.